No matter what else is happening in the world. There is always good news today. Welcome to Good News Today, the program where you will always find good news, no matter what else is happening in the world. I'm Jim Dearman, your host for Good News Today. Thanks again for joining us, and as always, let me tell you what's coming your way. Our devotional time begins every program, and that consists of our scripture reading, beautiful singing, and a brief study of our scripture. And today, our text includes what is so often called the golden text of the Bible. We're going to be looking at John chapter 3, verses 14 through 16, and it's that 16th verse that is so often called the golden text of the Bible. We'll get to that in just a moment after I tell you what else is coming your way. Today, Roger Campbell is back with us for an excellent Be Ready Always segment. And here's the question with which he will deal and give you an opportunity to answer those who contend for miraculous gifts continuing even today. The question, why don't we have genuine miracles taking place today? the kind Jesus and his apostles did in the first century. That's the the issue with which Roger will deal, and as always, he will deal with it in such a scriptural but very logical and easy-to-understand manner. You will not want to miss that. And then it's something to share, the segment with Mark Teske, the co-producer of Good News Today. And he comes along to talk about cheerful giving. And then our final segment, Have a Bible Question with Guyton Montgomery and Troy Spradlin. And the question with which those brethren will deal today is, does Romans 11.26 teach the unconditional salvation of the Jews? It does say, and so all Israel will be saved. Does that mean they will be saved unconditionally? Those brethren will deal with that question and they have a Bible question segment. So we're so glad that you have come our way. Now let's read John chapter 3, verses 14 through 16, where the words of Jesus are recorded when he says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm going someday to yonder fair land. I'll make it my home. I'll make it my home by holding his hand. Oh, it's how we shall see. When I walk through the gate.
And we're back for the study portion of our devotional time. John chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. That's the text we read uh, a few moments ago. And as we said, this text includes what is often called the golden text of the Bible. That's uh, verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal or everlasting, but have everlasting life. But let's go back to verse 14. And here Jesus says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so, even so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. Now to what does, uh, to what does he refer? Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. In other words, he is referring here to his crucifixion. He knew it was coming and he was willing to face it because he knew the seriousness of sin and he knew the price that had to be paid, the, the sinless blood of Christ without blemish and without spot. But to what does he refer? He refers to Moses lifting up a, a serpent in the wilderness. That takes us back to Numbers chapter 21. And you remember on that occasion, the disciples, uh, the followers of Moses, uh, and the followers of God, of course, who had left Egypt, they had been characteristically murmurers at times. And this was one of those occasions when they murmured for a lack of things that they didn't have the patience to allow God to give them in His time and on His terms, but they complained and murmured. Well, on this occasion, God sent fiery serpents among them. Fiery is indicating poisonous serpents. They were poisonous serpents that were sent among them. And many of the Israelites were dying. And on this occasion, that got their attention, of course, and they cried out to Moses and pleaded with him to intercede for them. And Moses did so. And what did God tell Moses to do? Well, he told, them, he told him to do something that from perhaps a human perspective might seem to be somewhat unusual. He told him to, uh, to fashion a brazen or bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And he said, then, in fact, tell the people, whoever looks upon it, will be saved from that poisonous snake bite. In other words, they had to look in order to live. Now keep in mind too that this is a type, a type of something that was ultimately to come that would be the antitype or the fulfillment of it. The study of types and antitypes is a beautiful and faith-building study in Scripture, of course. Moses, for example, as the mediator between the people and God, in the Old Testament during his lifetime, he was typical of Christ who would become the mediator and high priest of Christians today. And so there's a typical situation or arrangement there that is beautiful to study. And it gives us clear evidence, incidentally, of the inspiration of Scripture because man, unaided by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, could never have put together a book with such unity and harmony, with prophecy with types and antitypes, with every aspect of Scripture. But that's the type here in the Old Testament to which Jesus makes reference when He says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. He was talking about His crucifixion. Now there's another text in John chapter 12, 32 that kind of ties in here. Jesus said, and I if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself, as the New King James renders it. I, if I am lifted up from the earth, he's talking about on the cross, being lifted up, I will draw, I will draw all peoples to myself. The cross is the drawing power of God if we fully understand and appreciate the significance of the cross, the magnitude of the cross. So, He's saying, Moses lifted up that serpent, and I must also be lifted up. That, in order that whoever believes, believes in him, should not perish, but have eternal life. And then, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but 
have everlasting life. So he uses eternal and everlasting interchangeably because they mean one and the same thing. But notice here, whoever believes in him. But what kind of belief is Jesus referring to here? He's referring to the same kind of belief that those in the wilderness had to have in that bronze serpent. What kind of faith or belief did they have to have in the bronze serpent that Moses was instructed by God to erect so that those who'd been bitten could be healed? They had to look at it. They had to do something. They had to obey what God through Moses told them to do in order to be saved from death through snake bite. It involved action on their part. Their belief was an obedient belief. They had to respond. What if a man said, oh, I have too much faith to go out there and look at, my, uh, and look at that bronze serpent. I believe I can be saved just staying right here in my tent because I have enough faith. He would have died right there in his tent because he had to go out and look at the serpent. Jesus is saying, whoever believes in me with that same kind of faith will be saved. In other words, it has to be obedient faith. You see, sometimes the word belief is used, or faith is used, those words are used in a comprehensive or inclusive sense. In other words, including every other act of obedience, which is not only belief as a separate act, but repentance, confession of Christ, and baptism for the remission of sins. But sometimes the word believe is used in that comprehensive sense. Let me give you uh, one example of that. In Romans 13, verse 11, Paul wrote this to these Christians now, writing to Christians, and he says, uh, and do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. How does Paul use the word believe there? Our salvation is nearer, Christians, now than when we first believed. But how did these, what did these Romans have to do to become Christians? Faith only? No, go back to Romans 6, 3, and 4, where he wrote to the same people, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Baptism was the culminating act of their faith where they contacted the blood of Christ, where heaven applied that blood, and where they rose to walk in newness of life. But in Romans 13, 11, Paul refers back to that time and just calls it when we first believed. He uses belief in that comprehensive sense. That's the very same way it's used in John chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. In verse 15 and again in verse 16. It's obedient faith that saves. Well, that's all the time we have for our devotional time. Time now for Be Ready Always, and the subject is miracles. You don't want to miss this. Here's Roger Campbell. The Bible says that Christians are to be ready to give a defense or give an answer, 1 Peter 3 and verse number 15. If someone were to ask you, why don't we have genuine miracles taking place today like Jesus and the apostles did, how would you answer that question? Well, let me suggest to you it's very important that we begin with an understanding of what the word miracle even means. Now, the way people use the word miracle today, well, it's used in a number of different ways, oftentimes in ways that are not Scripture. The word miracle comes from a Greek word that simply meant power. A miracle was a supernatural, that is, above and beyond the laws of nature. A supernatural act of power which had immediate and observable results. When someone healed a lame man, that man was healed instantaneously and everybody could see it. Again, a miracle, supernatural act of power which had immediate and observable results results. A second question that's really important as we work through this discussion is, what was the purpose? Why did Jesus and his followers even do miracles? 
Well, if you want to know about Jesus and why he did miracles, Jesus said this about himself as we read in John 5 and verse 36. But I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. So, so Jesus did miracles to prove that what he said about himself was true. We read about him saying, I came down from heaven. We read of him saying, the Father sent me. We read of him saying, I am the Christ. I am the Son of God. Well, where's the proof? One of the proofs he gave was the miracles which he did, which confirmed what he said about himself, was true. Well, what about his followers? In Mark chapter 16 and verse number 20, the Bible says about his disciples, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. So as the disciples went out to preach, the Lord was working with them. Doing what? Confirming the word. With what? With signs or wonders or miracles. What does that mean that he was confirming the word? The miracles that they would perform would prove that what they were preaching was true. Now, that's no guarantee. That's no guarantee that the people were going to line up to become followers of Jesus, but their miracles were performed to show the reliability and the trustworthiness of what they said. But back to our question, why don't we have real miracles today? Let me give you three quick answers. Number one, we don't have real miracles today because we don't need them. Remember, the miracles were to confirm the revelations that came from God. Before Jesus went back to heaven, when he was together with his apostles in Jerusalem, the night before he was crucified, he made this promise. He said, I'm going away, but the comforter, that is the Holy Spirit, he's going to come to you. And when the Holy Spirit comes to you, he's going to guide you into all truth. John 16 and verse 13. Now, did that promise come true? Sure it did. In the first century, in the lifetime of the apostles, the Holy Spirit guided them into all truth. Well, once all truth was given, there are no new revelations. If there are no new revelations, there's no need to confirm a new revelation that doesn't exist. And so we don't have miracles today because we don't need them. Number two, we don't have genuine miracles today because there are no apostles alive who can lay their hands on other disciples to cause them to receive miraculous powers. You and I can read in Acts 8, verses 14 to 20, about Peter and John laying hands on disciples so they could receive miraculous power. Same thing in Acts 19. No apostles today, so no power to lay hands on others to cause them to receive those powers. And then a third reason, we don't have miracles today because it never was God's plan for miracles to be permanent. They're temporary. The tongues and the prophecies and miraculous knowledge and all of the miraculous abilities, they were temporary. They were going to cease. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 10, they were going to be in effect until the perfect, that is, the complete Word of God given to mankind. We don't have miracles today because we don't need them. It's, got, it's God's plan not to have them, and they fulfilled their purpose. I'm Roger Cannon, and this has been Be Ready Always. What a beautiful, logical explanation of that subject by Roger Campbell. Our thanks to Roger Campbell. Coming up, it's something to share with Mark Teske after a brief and important information break. You may have questions or comments about Good News Today. We'd like to hear from you. Or if you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address is Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. Again, that's Good News Today, 
P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. You may prefer to email us at goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. That's goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. Or call us toll free at 1 877 384 7221. That's 1 877 384 7221. We'd like to hear from you. Hearing from our audience is always good news to us. We hope you take advantage of that contact information. We want you to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter also. Right now, it's time to follow Mark Teske. He has something to share. Hello there, friend. I've got something I'd like to share with you. I've heard of a song leader who was a real tightwad. He would give just as little as he thought he could get away with. One Sunday, he was asked to lead a song before the contribution in order to help prepare the minds of the brethren before they gave the money. He led a song that contains the words, When we asunder part, it gives us inward pain. That described him in his contribution. You see, God loves a cheerful giver, as he tells us in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7. Our attitude toward our giving is as important as our amount. The poor widow was commended when she gave two mites compared to the rich who put in much. Her giving was sacrificial, and theirs was merely a token of their wealth. When you give of your means, do you consider it an honor and a privilege? Do you find yourself wishing that you could give even more? Do you look for creative ways to be able to save a few dollars here and there so that you can give it to others? Do you give things up, things for yourself, so that you can give more? Or are you like the man who, when parted from his money, gives you inward pain? God loves a cheerful giver. Give cheerfully and then share this with someone else. You know, Mark's discussion of giving reminds me to remind our audience that the churches of Christ and individual members of the churches of Christ make good news today possible. That's why you'll never hear us ask for, uh, for contributions from uh, those in our audience because the churches of Christ make this possible by their contributions uh, individually and collectively and the first day of the week uh, and the congregations that share with good news today. Right now, it is time for Have a Bible Question right after this brief break. time now for Have a Bible Question. Sure, you know, today's question comes from the book of Romans, and uh, that's uh, uh, always a fun book to study, isn't it? Absolutely. So what do we got? All right. The question comes from actually Romans chapter 11, verse 26, and what they want to know is whether or not this passage means that all Jews will be saved unconditionally. I believe the wording that was given to me is, does Romans eleven twenty six teach the unconditional salvation of of the Jews. Well, reading the verse, I can see why they would think that because it says, and so all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So I could see why somebody would be confused about that, why they would think that he's going to save all the Jews. Exactly. You know, and uh, to but to think about it from the idea of unconditional, everyone being saved, no matter what they do, 
that doesn't fit the entirety of Scripture at all because, I mean, from the very beginning, Garden of Eden, God has always put an expectation of obedience in order to receive the rewards. Exactly. In fact, uh, you know, if you just look at the context of this verse, the very chapter, I mean, he's talking about the Gentiles, and we're already in chapter 11 of Romans of this great book, as you mentioned, where he's already talked about obedience, obedience, obedience. And here he's talking about the Gentiles being grafted in. If you just back up a few verses and you see that, just the fact that he uses this idea of an olive tree shows that a change has taken place. Oh, exactly. And what he's trying to emphasize to them that, yes, there are those that are no longer a part of this uh, branch anymore. These branches have been broken off because of their unbelief, it actually says. I believe um, verse 20, uh, verse 19 through 20, mm -hmm. that will say then the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Now, remember, the, the ones being grafted in, he spoke speaking to are the Gentiles, uh -huh. the ones broken off are Jewish people. Right. Verse 20, well, because of unbelief, mm. they were broken off and thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. And remember scriptures teach us like in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verse six, but without faith, it's impossible Amen. to please him. So the idea is not so much that there's unconditional salvation for them, but that God would fulfill the promise of salvation made to the fathers ahead of time. And so the warning is being given to the Gentiles, don't boast against the Jews. Exactly, exactly. And so that's what they need to understand whenever you're looking at that. How would you understand this whenever the letter was written? Not some future salvation of, of this entire uh, uh, nation. And so basically, what does God require? Going back to what you said as far as obedience, God has always required obedience. He's talking about obedience. So the same thing that's required of the Gentiles is required of the Jews. And so this is not necessarily talking about physical Israel. Exactly. We talk, talk about this idea of a spiritual Israel. And, and I think about that in Galatians chapter 3, because Paul, again, is writing, trying to e explain this meshing of Jew and Gentile together inside the church. And it's in Galatians 3 verse, um, oh, where is it? Uh, 29, if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Perfect. And so it, it's salvation is not unconditional. It is for those that have faith, those that obey God, and we can all be a part of this promise when we are part of the spiritual Israel. Amen. And thank you for being with us for another edition. Good news today. All around the world. Good news. Always good news. Good news. Good news. There is good news today. Good news. Good news. Always good news. Good news. Good news. There is good news today. All around the world. Good news. Always good news. Good news, good news, there is good news today.